Stories of the Week is brought to you by Anapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at anapsis.com. And by Pony Express, check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at ponyexpress.com. And by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. I also want to mention that there is a Pony Express webcast about how PCI can be a threat to your organization. Yes, I believe it. Hold on. If you go to ponyexpress.com and you go to resources and you go to webinar, it's right there on their main page. Actually, if you go to ponyexpress.com, there's a gigantic banner ad. Click register here. And it's PCI DSS. Can PCI be a threat to your organization? They've assembled a panel of five different folks, uh, some CISOs, uh, some uh, QSA, and the director of security uh, from another organization to talk about PCI. It sounds like a very interesting webcast to me. Um, I think it's an interesting take on PCI as a threat to your organization. So make sure you go check that out, PonyExpress.com. I also tweeted that out today uh, and put it on all of our social media. So Nice. What we got for stories. I mean, and now the stories for this week. What? Um, Pirate Bay co-founder Tiamo arrested in Thailand. Did you guys read this story? No. Oh, well, yeah, as, as you know, I was uh, mostly um, I, I was mostly yeah. dark so, last week. Um, and then apparently, yeah. this guy uh, was living in Laos since 2012, and had been traveling. They say 30 times to Thailand, where he has a house on the resort island of Fu- Phuket. 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 Ma Jen. Emma song. What? Anyway. So he was going between Laos and Thailand, and apparently that's where he finally got caught. I'm kind of thinking, like, if he had stayed in one place and just kind of laid low, he would have been all right. But he got caught crossing the border, I believe, from Laos into Thailand, yeah. Mm. But um, to stay living – so he, he skipped bail, essentially, uh. and evaded the law for two years. That's crazy. Why, why would you do that? I don't know why you would do that. It's crazy, though. No, I mean, why would you move? I mean, yeah, why, would you, why wouldn't you just... Uh, well, I guess, you know, I don't know. He was convicted in 2009 of aiding copyright uh, infringement. So, um, And now that said... No, five years ago. So he was convicted five years ago. He and three others were given one-year sentences in order to pay $3.6 million in damages. And then he fled Sweden while on bail. So he skipped bail, lived in Laos for five years, had a resort home in Thailand. Uh, kind of interesting how he was able to make that work with, I mean, finances and all that stuff. Yeah, you, no you think they would have found him based now, on a financial now, trail. According to the story, he was subject to an international warrant. Yep. Now, I, I know international law gets really kind of squirrely when it comes to uh, tracking people down, which is why people love to move around different countries if they're running. But um, – what is this international warrant thing? Maybe it was an Interpol thing, um, where Asia was uh, a cooperative. I, I, I'm, I'm I don't just know. Curious it took him that. five years to find him, though. I thought that was pretty interesting. I mean, I'm not yeah. an expert in like international law. I just thought, like, how did this guy get uh, you know get around for five years without getting caught? Maybe they just weren't really trying to find him. I don't know. Well, I mean, the thing that's interesting to me is he was he was in Asia, um, who you know. Maybe this is a bad stereotype, but it, it, it seems like Asia has been fairly tolerant of uh, yeah. uh, piracy mm-hmm. and copyright uh, issues um, as opposed to the West who, you know, we, we generally try to crack down on it. Um, uh, and yet he got actually caught and arrested in, uh, you know, in Thailand uh, from Laos. So that's uh, that's an interesting turn of events. It may be uh, that, that the legal... Um, uh, lo- the the laws in these various countries are, are being more cooperative with with uh, intellectual property issues, which um, I think is a positive spin uh, because uh, we need we need them to be. Uh, yeah, the other Pirate Bay uh, co-founder, Godfred Warg, was arrested in Cambodia in 2012, sent back to Sweden 
where he was last week sentenced by a Danish court to three and a half years in prison for hacking into computers and illegally downloading files from IT giant CSC. So these guys just weren't, I, they weren't on trial just for the Pirate Bay stuff either. They were on trial for um, a bunch of other stuff. Crimes other against computer crime computer infringement. Crimes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I know, so we don't often talk about that kind of stuff, so I thought it was kind of interesting. An interesting yeah, read. very good. Larry, what do you got? Belkin overflows. Yeah, I thought the, this one was kind of interesting. Um, that uh, Integrity Labs has a, uh, a post for a CVE 2014-1635, um, basically how they went from finding the O'Day to an exploit for a buffer overflow on the Belkin N750, um, and how they you know go around you know saying, hey, we've we've got this firmware, we need to do the extraction of the file system. Turns out uh, we used. Um, some virtualization of the whole router system, um, how we can get around all of this stuff, um, doing bin walk on the firmware, getting the file system. Sounds like exactly what we teach in my class. Exactly. And then uh, once you've got the virtualization down, getting the appropriate services running uh, within the virtualization environment. And I just want to say, away. that's a, uh, to use the Rhode Island term, that's a wicked pain in the ass. Yeah, that's exactly what he was sort of em mm -hmm. emphasizing. And then going through the um, using, uh, discovering the vulnerability in the execution and then how that you can get that processed with the web server yep. that was you there. You need Ida Pro. I mean, to get as far as they did, you need Ida Pro. Yep, they were using and the Ida reason Pro. for that, people are like, well, can't you use like the other free debuggers and disassemblers? Mm -hmm. No, unfortunately, unless someone Nips. wants to send this email, PSW at securityweekly.com, in all of our <laughs> research and in all these examples, you see Ida Pro because it is the one debugger disassembler that yes. can do ARM and MIPS. Yep. That's, that's that's the sticky yep. issue. And yep. I'm assuming this was MIPS. And, and N750, yeah, it was I believe, MIPS. was MIPS. It was yeah. MIPS. Yep. And find out where there's some string copies and then how they can get it exploited. Turns out on this device that the web server is the one that is running on the device that faces guest wireless connections. Hmm. So you can set up your router, have your secure connection for your home stuff out to the internet, and you can set a separate one specifically for guests that show up that want to use your internet that you allow them to. It's the web server that faces the guest internet. They created an exploit and uh, a Metasploit module so that it now will execute uh, specific IP tables commands so that you can log in as uh, via Telnet from the guest network directly to a root shell. And these oh. Belkin N750s, sell, <laughs> they're currently selling on Amazon for $68. Yep. Prime shipping. Yep. Add to cart. <laughs> <laughs> Next, yep. next, finished. That's awesome. N seven fifty DB Wi Fi dual band. N did they notify Belkin routing. of this? Belkin's been there's a, a CV. There's a CVE for it, so yeah. I assume that. They so I assume did. that they did. Yeah, Belkin's been pretty good about. Um, <laughs> well, Belkin's part of that build it secure dot build it securely build it secure yeah, dot yeah. ly initiative. Uh, I th I think that's is that Belkin? I think that is. Build it secure dot ly. Dot ly. And yeah, Belkin is, is on there as participating in that. So how about D-Link? Is D-Link there? D-Link is not there. No, <laughs> Belkin's the only like Soho company that is on there. There's a bunch of other. Well, Dropcam, um, which is the cloud-based monitoring service, and a couple other vendors that I haven't heard of before, are part of that. But Belkin's the only like of all the Soho router like Netgear, Linksys, blah blah blah. Kind nice. of thing. Now, what was the brand of the router that you got that looks like the SR71 Blackbird? Was that Belkin? Uh, that might be a net. That's a Netgear. Um, it's a Netgear Nighthawk. Okay. It's a Netgear Nighthawk. Um, that that's the one that actually people say is better than the Linksys WRT 1900 AC, which was their kind of replacement <laughs> for the WT54GL. Yep. Um, they said that the Netgear Nighthawk was a better platform. And actually, I think it has some more flash and RAM than that other. Interesting. And it's comparatively priced and a better platform. Yeah. I, I uh, get for it. running open source software, even, yeah. is from what people tell me. Um, on the budget side of that, there's a TP-Link. I think the one that you had, it's $16. Yeah, What's 703N. Yeah. Yep. That, I've got one of those, too. I that's think. the most economical. I mean, if you want to play around with open work, 
What is that router number? Uh, it's the uh, uh, TP-Link uh, WR703N, if I recall. And uh, I see them above regularly for about $25. Uh, you can get them down to about 18 uh, in quantity. And uh, I actually I need to order some because those are the routers that I use to do uh, the Rogue AP hiding for the 617 CTF. And I've had two of them stolen in the last I got a 702N. 702N. Interesting. <coughs> a 702N is 1999. Really? Does it do uh, open work? I believe that it does. Oh, maybe it doesn't. Maybe that's why it was so cheap. Oh, wow. I've got a completely different one. I, I thought I had the same one. I've got a TP-Link, um, I guess an older one here, a, a 402M. Uh, interesting. But uh, might have to play with that a little bit. That's what she said. That's what she said, yeah. Actually, I've had that for quite some time. I used it as a uh, uh, a, t a tie me over device uh, when um, I had a lightning strike at the house that... Uh, oh. Oh, okay. okay. So the 702N is two megs of flash, not supported by open work. Okay, but the 703 is. The, 703 the 703N is the megs. one version, is the one that use, is used in the Mini Poner by Kevin Bong. Yep. And um, the ones that we used for badges for the Mid Atlantic CCDC a couple of years ago. Yep. I, I bought Which that I small little TP Link one to carry with me so that we can reverse engineer the firmware in class. Nice. So. Nice. Yeah. No, the 703 is uh, is the 703 fun. is the one that you want. Yep. 703 is the one you want for uh, actually putting. Yeah, and I got that reminds me. I got to order some of those because I have two, I've had two of them stolen in the last year, uh, and they run. And I've had those they're run 30, 30 with bucks use. Are, they're thirty bucks on Amazon. Yeah, uh, you can get them elsewhere for less. For less, it's a, a WR703N, right? Yep. Uh, the okay. TLWR703N. Yep. They will run on. The, they will run for about twenty four hours. On two eighteen six fifty batteries at uh, twenty hundred milliamp hours apiece. Wow! So yeah, they do really well. That is really good. Yep. I'm becoming <coughs> very familiar with those batteries. Yep. Because <laughs> they're the same batteries that are used by every vape mod like on the planet. Well, it's very common for a, for a yep. vape mod to have those batteries. Yep. And they're the same batteries that are used in laptop batteries, as you said. Yep. And uh, a lot of the tactical flashlights too. Interesting. Yep. So good battery to have on here. I bought a new charger for those batteries. The one with the LCD screen mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. that, that tells you all the diagnostic information about the battery and things we like used that. So I have so many of those batteries. Yeah, I, like I, those. I went and actually bought some cases from Deal Extreme that fit two of them in, and you can charge USB out. I gotcha. And you can charge them with USB. Oh, can you show me a link to that? Um, yeah, we can find. Oh, you can go to Deal Extreme and find them. It's not okay. a problem. Um, they take two of them. They were, I think, they were about a dollar twenty a piece. So the electronics are a little cheap. They get a little warm. Yep. But uh, we used the heck out of those at Disney last week just because throw like six of them in the bag and we had three phones at the parks and we were doing ingress and they su the ingress sucks your battery like crazy. And next thing you know, you've got 20% battery life. You plug that thing in, you wait half an hour and you've got 60%. And your battery, your pocket's oh, nice so and those things will take the 18650s and charge <coughs> your phone with them? Absolutely. And they charge over USB. Oh, so you so play in your laptop. So they act like a those really expensive. Because yeah. I bought one for fifty bucks at the Apple Store because I needed one when I was yep. traveling. Yep. Uh. Yep. We can find. So we put those batteries in that thing. You can. So the other one is you don't put the case top on. You charge them with that. You can use them as the uh, charge your phone stuff. And then mm -hmm. when you're done, you put them back in. You charge them, and you can use them in your vape. You can use yeah, them in your yeah. flashlight. Right. It's and you can charge them over USB. I mean, I'm sure you've got something in a hotel room that you can charge USB, mm -hmm. whether it be your iPhone adapter, your laptop, you name Anything, it. Anything. Yeah. You name it. 12 volt to USB charger, Joff. Ah, yeah, nice. Yeah, um, exactly. Actually, I'm running uh, something I want to build here at home is uh, actually a 24, 24 volt powered uh, USB charger because I'd. Like you've probably run into, Larry, if you're running some solar stuff, it's it's much better to run your devices on DC rather than invert back to AC yep, and then definitely. back down again. Um, so uh, I've been interested in building a little bit of an infrastructure in, on direct direct current uh, for a couple of things. Yep. Um, but anyway. Anyway. Uh, good stuff. Cool, because, yeah, I, I need to buy a new uh, access point for, for home. The two that I've got um, are have seen better days. I've got an airport extreme at home that someone mm -hmm. gave to me that's working really well. How much uh, do you want to spend? 
I, I don't want to spend a lot of money, but because uh, I tell you what, the my choice, and I've you and I both have been Net doing game. access points for a long time. Yeah. Um, my choice is Ubiquity. Is it the that's the Netgate one? Uh, no, Ubiquity you can buy on Amazon. You can buy a kit with three access points. Ubiquity. Ubiquity. Yep. On Amazon. Ubiquity Unify. There was As an AP, huh? Yep. Ubiquity Networks, Unify AP, Enterprise Wi-Fi System. You get three of those, um, and you can buy... Uh, you can buy... I bought individual uh, PoE adapters for them, mm-hmm. but just yep. the access points themselves, you get three of them for 200 bucks. You get this little nice. j- crappy Java application to configure them. Dude has run my Wi-Fi for maybe two years. No, a year. I bought these in October of 2013. It's run my Wi-Fi in my house for a year. Awesome. Awesome. Like, we talk about devices you can hack and firmware, reverse engineering, and all these Soho routers. What I found, and I've worked with probably 50 different devices and looked at firmware on them, and they all, in their own way, suck. And they all die. (laughs) Um, This one, for 200 bucks, you get three of them. Uh, yeah, I've talked about it on the show before. I mean, they're awesome. Hmm. They're awesome. Okay. That yeah, might they be got like four and a half star reviews on Amazon. That might be interesting. Best <coughs> coverage. Yeah, because my I thing got one in my second floor. I've got one in my office in the basement, and I've got one in my workshop because my workshop is like dead zone Wi-Fi because it's yep. like underneath yep. the deck and embedded half into the. Yep, and I've already got I've already got a power over Ethernet switch at home, so that would be. Yeah, work. these, Dude, these uh, AP. APs, Paul, do they talk to each other in terms of intelligent handoff of uh, roaming devices? Or? They do. Yeah, they actually, all these, uh, if you scan them, like with Nessus and Nmap like I have, they run Linux. They're oh, like yeah. small okay. little Linux devices. But they look like a smoke detector, so you can put them in your house and it looks it looks halfway yeah. decent. So um, your wife won't complain at you. Yeah, and no, my wife loves it because now Wi-Fi works like awesome. <laughs> <laughs> No, I've got a um, well, you know, I I'm, I kind of cheat a little bit. I'm I've got a ESX uh, server running, so I've got a uh, a, uh, a Cisco virtual um, wireless controller running. So oh, nice. Uh, which wow, which, we are nerds. Yeah, we're crazy nerds. <laughs> yeah, and see, I see, I use my uh, Netgate box, the wireless adapter for the Sans classes, and I've been having a little bit of trouble with that lately. That it's starting to get overloaded with more than you know, twenty devices or so. You got PF Sense on your Netgate device? Yeah, I have PF Sense on that Netgate device. And it's getting yeah. overloaded, really. So yeah. I, I got just, stri- like, just strictly like the wireless portion because it's you know 20 devices mm-hmm. for students and then plus whoever wants to jump on it because it's an open access point. Yeah. And I tell you, I've had and the great most luck fun with ubiquity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I set them up on 1, 6, and 11 channels throughout my house. And, uh, I mean, you can pretty much be anywhere on my property and get good Wi-Fi, which is important if you're a nerd like us. Yep. Yeah. No. And that's that's kind of interesting because yeah. I, and the other thing is, I don't think I have any devices that support AC. So, and I'm not going to for some time. So I don't know that it makes sense for me to pick up a device that supports AC. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <coughs> yeah I mean, you could have one. Uh, the Netgear Nighthawk was the one that I've researched yep. extensively. Netgear Nighthawk in electronics. Uh, Netgear Nighthawk Tri-Band AC3200 is $261. So that's more expensive than those three Ubiquiti access points. Exactly. Um, And there's also a Nightgear. Oh, no. Here we go. Oh, the AC1900. AC1900 is the one I have. The R7000. The R8000 I haven't seen before. That's a a newer model. I have the R7000 here in the studio. uh, For just messing around with. And it that one seems really good. That gets really good. There's a 7500 too. I'm not sure what the difference now is. Is uh, AC is all on five gigahertz, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. Because uh, yeah. they need the cha- they need the bandwidth uh, mm-hmm. to, to push the data. Yeah, yeah, and multi- right. multiple channel channel. Yeah, it's whips, the old the old MIMO on steroids. Yep. <laughs> kind of approach. Um, yep. But they uh, do they claim? Have you ever have you worked with AC at all? Um, either no, one of you? No, not really. No. no. Okay. It'd be interesting to see. I just just out of curiosity, where they actually can push the kind of bandwidth they're advertising, right? Yeah, oh, not. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, pretty darn, pretty darn close for sure. Because um, you can take a, a 160 megahertz wide channel with AC 
one channel 160 megahertz wide. So basically, you're taking the whole a range. You're taking the whole spectrum. <laughs> yeah, you're taking you're taking a whole five gigahertz allocation and using it for one channel. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I you, you relate that to the whole concept of water pipe. You have a one inch water pipe; you can only push so much water down it. But you take a twelve inch water pipe, and you can <laughs> fit significantly more water down it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Pipe. Speaking of all these wireless routers and all this good stuff, Paul, mm. did you see my story number two? Nope. Uh, it was uh, LOL WPS. Oh, I had the story too. So yeah, there was the D Link WPS pin selection algorithm. Um and I didn't great, dig, dig, great didn't dig into it too did, didn't dig always. in it too deep. Yeah. But uh turns out that the D Link WPS pin selection is but default from the factory is based on the device's MAC address. It's based on its uh oh, nice. <laughs> WAN MAC address. WAN, we, yeah, your WAN MAC address, which, if you can observe the wireless MAC address in the air, it's off by like three in any direction. Yeah. And he said that it's the manufacturer OID? Yep. OID. Organizational OID. You can identify it. It's the manufacturer's OID portion of the MAC address that is used with some basic math. Well, so it's the if you read the article, it's not really, I mean, it's, yeah, it's yeah. math, right? So, yeah. but it, it uses just that portion of the MAC address to derive the pin. And oh, Craig, really? I mean, yeah, it's no, no, it's like got it's got to be the device unique one because if it was organizational, everyone sorry, would have the, the, same, uh, the yeah. same pin. Yes, you're yeah, right. Yeah, okay. I'm so sorry. it's the other end. It's the lower, so that, that would be the, the uh, lower. lower 24 bits of the address that is used to derive the pin. Yep. So uh, uh, sort of my comment on this is, uh, um, you know, we talk about, uh, we, I know we've talked about Reaver, doing Reaver for WPS mm -hmm. pin brute forcing and why that works. Um, but uh, sure enough, I'm waiting for uh, Reaver from Tactical Network Solutions to come up with a patch for detecting that it is a uh, D-Link device in use and being able to define the the MAC address and do some quick calculations based on some deviation for that MAC address and crack those WPS pins. Now, the thing that I think was laughing about this was that uh, think about how uh, you change the WPS pin on your devices. Any can ideas? You change? Can, any ideas? Uh, it's in the co it's in the firmware though. It's not. In it's the well, it's in the firmware, but is it ever exposed to the user to be able to change? No, because I, if you turn over if you turn over your router, where is it printed? On the back. On usually. the back. So how would you change that in software and change the sticker at the same time? So Craig says since the WPS pin is typically programmed into NVRAM, uh, he was looking for NVRAM queries, but it's not stored in NVRAM. And if it's in NVRAM, then the web interface right. probably has a right. spot to change it. Now. Because NVRAM is where your configurable settings are Right. Stored. Now, it all depends on the, the device manufacturer. And what they were doing in the past was your uh, WPS pin was fixed from the manufacturer because it was printed on a nice little sticker. It's stored somewhere on the device because I've encountered one device, and I think it was a D-Link now that I think about it, and I've got some screenshots actually here on this machine that allowed you to change the WPS pin, but also had a little button that was basically restored to factory default. Mm -hmm. So match the sticker on the bottom. But that was one of the yeah. few routers that I've ever seen that gave you the option to change the WPS pin. Um, and, yeah, that's it's the WPS thing is is terribly broken. Come t see 617 and we'll talk about how it's broken. Nice. What a great segue. Larry. I know. I know. Uh, let me uh I get that screenshot. Let me uh pull that out and tell you which manufacturer that was that allowed you to actually change it. Um come on, it's in this directory. I know it okay, is. Okay, so for all our listeners, I am absolutely certain Larry is a fabulous teacher. I've never actually had a class from him though, so I have nothing to back that up. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Is this it? Nope. That's not it. Oh man. I don't know where where's the damn pictures? Uh, what oh, are you, what yeah. are you looking for? Sorry. WPS change pin. I've got a screenshot. It's a Belkin. Gotcha. Oh, uh, yeah. It was actually my mother-in-law's router that I found it that you could change it. Interesting. Yep. It's, it's interesting a, how our family becomes guinea pigs for stuff like that. Yep. What else we got for stories? Um, There's a couple more in there. Oh, I added this... 
Uh, do we want to talk more about links? Well, I got, I got a, yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead. Two. Go ahead. Just go ahead, Joff. Joff. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't have to talk right, about right. it. Yes, please do. Oh, please do, he says. Uh, so, okay, well, a couple of quick stories. Um, Google released a tool called No Go To Fail, uh, a network traffic security testing tool. It's a fairly short story, but the, the idea here is that Google's very focused on uh, TLS in general, uh, SSL and TLS, and, and they were very interested in uh, having a, a lightweight tool that would actually help um, particularly mobile developers to point out any TLS issues um, that might be uh, um, present, uh, at least on the server end of things, and so they released a little tool to do so. I, I'm going to check it out at some point. I have not yet, so uh, uh, we'll see what they see what they're doing. I'm sure a lot of the commercial scanners um, do similar things, so they probably get a very mu very much lightweight version of same. Um, and what else did I have here? Uh, Oh, Drupal, yeah. So uh, uh -oh. yet another content management system uh, gets pwned. Um, this time it's Drupal's turn with a SQL injection flaw. So SQL injection returns something we think, or we'd like to think, is slowly going away <coughs> in time. But uh, yeah, not so much, right? And it was in the core of Drupal's engine, so oh. pretty bad stuff. I'm not into plug-in either. That's... Yeah, so oh. that's uh, that one was was not a good story. So anybody's out there using Drupal, please, 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 please upgrade immediately. Actually, preferably don't use it. But uh, did I say that? No. Mm -hmm. But uh, do your upgrades. I know content management systems are sort of oh, they all suck. Necessary evil, I guess, for some folks, and from a security perspective, certainly necessary evil. But uh, do your upgrades. Uh, lock it down as quick as you can. Uh, that one's bad. So uh, so yep. There was a password hash disclosure in Lynx's smart Wi-Fi routers, basically doing a get of <laughs> dot .ht password oh, to oh, turn geez. the password hash. <laughs> Dear God. Now, what's more interesting about this, go read the link in the show notes. Um, this researcher, whose name I won't butcher, um, but the link is in the show notes. Simon Ruhoff. Yes. Thank you, Larry. Um he sent a bunch of emails to both Linksys and Belkin support because Linksys is so. What do they say in this one? They say um, on March fifteenth, twenty thirteen, Belkin completed the acquisition of Linksys. So any vulnerability reports on Linksys products should be handled by the Belkin incident response team, who the P cert at Cisco CC'd, and then Belkin kind of gives them the runaround. And then he finally sends an email to both of them and says, uh, is this vulnerability patched? And then he checked the CERT website and found that they fixed the issue. And apparently they issued a CVE number. Um, in th found an error in that. And then he looked through the release notes of the firmware and found that they fixed a security vulnerability in libupnp but that's a different vulnerability than oh the one that God. he found. So they silently fixed his vulnerability. Uh. Very poor handling on Belkin. Belkin, Belkin Linksys, Cisco. Belkin, Linksys, Cisco, whatever. All. Mostly Belkin because it's their, right. it's their baby now. Poor them. Hooray, Netgear. <laughs> <laughs> Netgear's. And Net, Netgear's the one on the securely, right? Belkin's the one. Belkin, the, oh. Belkin oh. is the one in the security. Yeah. So maybe you know, we should you know, just it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I don't mind that vendors get a little defensive, right, when they've got a vulnerability. Yeah, that, yeah, that, anyone naturally. That, yeah. Yeah, naturally that happens. But the responsibility aspect needs to come forward, right? I mean, do your software engineering, get your fix out, and then responsibly follow up with people. You know, and that's the part where where it seems like folks fall down. They get squirrely. They get way too defensive. I don't know whether it's the attorney population. I don't know what it is that... <laughs> Where uh, that goes off the rails. Yeah, right? I don't. I don't know why. Why you have to get squirrely with credit where credits due. Admit you have a vulnerability and give the person that found it and reported it credit. But but most people are smart enough to understand that that if they are told like, hey, we've got a problem here, but at the same time, in that in that telling of that story, they can say, well, we've done our work and we've got a fix for you. Most people are going to be, oh, okay. Great. Let me apply that. Awesome. Thank you so much for being responsible with your product. I mean, even like the most uneducated user is usually going to go, yeah, just tell me how to fix it. I'm good, you know. But to just kind of hide it away is just really irresponsible. Yep. Yep. 
Okay. Because now, because now, 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 now that end user that has half a clue has no idea that they need to update their router based on some specific it's, uh, vulnerabilities. Maybe we should all switch to D-Link. Oh wait. Oh. They're even worse with security. Mm. I hate to yeah, say that about a, a company, but they are. Well, maybe we should, Paul. We have tossed this idea around before, but you know, I mean, produce our own at at a, a cost effective level i mean i know how to do this i build them all the time um y you know how would you market it though because it, it's it'd be very hard to be cost competitive it would be yep absolutely that's the problem the ones we build ourselves cost 300 bucks yep, yep. and they, I mean, and they, that's really just for a a, a g gn yeah, radio and <laughs> never mind honestly, N or AC. wait no no we could do honestly, this ourselves we could start a kickstarter it. we could include <laughs> tor <laughs> onion <laughs> services oh nice yeah, we're going to start a Kickstarter project right here on the show, folks. You heard it. No, nah, it's not really going to happen. No. But, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I don't have much else. Chop was I that? think that's all I got for, for this Oh, evening. I do have one that uh, I wanted to talk with you about, Larry and Joff, uh, our two resident Wi-Fi experts. And this isn't Wi-Fi. This is radio signals. Um, did you read the leak-sensitive data from an isolated computer that's air-gapped and near a mobile phone? Uh, no. I didn't it is my that. story number seven. seven. I didn't catch that one. So apparently these researchers have proven that if there is a cell phone near the computer, that they can transfer data from the computer, even if that computer is air-gapped. Okay. So without using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Without using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. So what are they, uh, what are they doing... They say that I mobile phones come equipped with an FM radio receivers ah, and software okay. can intentionally create radio emissions from a video display unit, yep. so from the computer screen. This is the first time mobile phones consider an attack intended receiver of maliciously crafted radio signals emitted from the screen of the isolated computer. Yep, so yeah, you're... you're Wait, are they saying that the air gap <coughs> computer can infect the phone then and not the phone infecting the computer? Maybe I uh, had that background. No, no, they're using they're using the phone to uh, look look at the uh, RF emissions from the computer. I see. Yep. Yeah. There, you're, it, you're there, essentially you're essentially turning the LEDs in the monitor and or any portion of the oscillation within the the display of the monitor to create RF signals. Very similar to the way you remember when I brought the the Raspberry Pi. Yes. And with just a wire on the GPIO pin, mm -hmm. you're effectively turning off the GPIO pin fast enough to create uh, a wave which becomes FM radio, essentially. They say their tool AirHopper demonstrates how textual and binary data can be exfiltrated from a physically isolated computer to a mobile phone at distances of 1 to 7 meters. Yeah. Oh, yeah, th 13 to 60 BPS. The, uh, some of the, some of the uh, NSA documents that leaked had some similar work in them for detecting leak, leaked RF uh, modulations. Um, from you know, from various devices, keyboards, monitors, with the main right. focus. It sounds like something you'd on. see in Hollywood or on a TV show. Yeah, but yeah, but it's real. <clears throat> yep. But it's real. Yeah. So remember when I was saying uh, during the break about uh, uh, doing ham radio stuff during the period when the power was out? Yeah. Because um, all of these devices, the backlights in your monitor, the the display in the monitor, you name it, all emit RF energy, which becomes background noise. Mm -hmm. But if you can isolate that background noise and you make that one device, make that background noise have a discernible signal, mm -hmm. you can pull that out with a very with an FM receiver, such mm -hmm. as such as that. Same thing you're doing with that Raspberry Pi, uh, uh, Raspberry FM stuff. So, so Larry, you know. Oh, okay. Interestingly, yeah, that was an FM. Well, yeah. maybe not so much. What what is the defense? I mean, is the defense here put a lead box around your monitor and ground it? You know, I mean, what's you know, is is there a defense? Uh, so uh, so the RF interference, all that type of stuff, you know, detection is one way, which is going to be incredibly obscure to try to detect. But that's what we're coming to. Um, there is no real defense aside from a Faraday cage unless um, you were to create enough subtle noise to make those signals say, yeah. discernible. Right. The problem is that here in the U.S., creating that noise, depending on your ranges and type it's, of yeah, FCC, it's violation. An FCC violation and against the law for you know $11,000 per incident type right. of thing. Really? So, so I, mean, I mean, think the, the – um, so I can imagine a technology – uh, for example, in monitors, which does create some sort of 
broad spectrum noise to mask yep. um, the signal, which you know would be would be awesome. But if you, if you're into FCC violations, then um, that's not so awesome. No, uh, is it as much of a violation as spoofing your IMEI? Because from what I read online, that's like generally poo pooed upon. But, but it's. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. Why? That, I don't know. But spoofing your own IMEI, it's yours, technically. Yeah. It's technically, your unique right. I, I, device identifier. I don't, I, I'm not a lawyer on I'm that spoofing one. Spoofing one that I already and own. And there's, not l- and there's literally someone in their car screaming into the radio right now yeah. going, you idiot. Uh, we've yeah. had that moment before. Yeah. Um, so, so it does make me want to moments. build a Faraday cage around my office, by the way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which, by the way, uh, Joff, it's time to repaint. You can get uh, Wi-Fi restricting paint. You can get RF blocking paint. Oh, nice. Well, that's something that we um, should put in some show notes at some point. But do they make we it in did. Pur- do they we make did. It in purple for Joff's office? Oh, they do. They do. Actually, they make it in pink. Pink. Oh, That'd pink. Be nice. That'd be a nice oh, I love look a, for you. I love a, a pleasant <clears throat> tone of pink. Nice yeah. fuchsia. We, we actually did talk about that paint many years ago yeah. um, on the show back when we were in the old house in the basement right about the time when the laptop went <laughs> oh <laughs> yes oh. sky high um, but that, yeah it's like, like let's drink beer and that's when I realized beer had sharp contrast in alcohol content levels yes and it was uh, good beer Dogfish Head 90 Minute I, IPA yes did oh, I bring that uh, one or did you, you bring that one it uh, may have been I don't know who brought it but we drank a lot so, of it. So interestingly yes. on that topic, I think I just poured some some alcoholic substance into my keyboard. Hopefully, it doesn't blow up. But, you know, USB keyboards are cheap, I yep. suppose. Red wine, Joff? It is, actually, yeah. See, I, I we were at Disney with the family last week, and I didn't get to drink very much. Because, of course, we have a one-bedroom... Um, hotel room and the the baby was in the bedroom with us she'd go to bed and then the uh the seven-year-old would stay up while daddy drank his beer and she watched shows on her ipad on her on her mini ipad her nexus 7 but uh so i didn't have i mm. did have like one beer because she, she was tired and we walked like an average of 11 miles a day hey right. did you teach him to get your beer from the fridge yet that's of course. oh yeah yeah that's, that's i taught i taught mine that but now they're teenagers and I say, hey, go get me a beer. And they're like, ah, oh, yeah, whatever. F off, Dad. <laughs> See what nice. we have to look Wait. forward to? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Wait for that. Anyway. Oh, and uh, I do, before we uh, before we get, forget, yeah, um, because we already did. Maureen, wake up! <sighs> nice. I like how it just randomly inserts itself. Seemingly mm-hmm. randomly inserts itself into the show. That's what she said. Oh, it, uh, oh, it all, like, clipped on me when he said that. So whatever oh, he said, I didn't. So it was, Maureen. Wake oh, up. Go. Yes, Marine, wake up. Okay. Pound sign, wake up, Marine. I, I, I Not going to touch that one with a 10-foot pole. A <laughs> it's a Twitter st- hashtag, I know, Larry. I know, I know. You should have said hashtag. A, a, a subtle suggestion here. I think it's time to wrap this up. I should have yes. said hashtag. That's because I'm old. Okay, right. with that, we're right. going to take a short break, come back, and wrap up the show. Dude, why does my phone have a hashtag? With our pound sign and hashtags. <laughs> You know we need our, our production assistants both both spelled Marine's name wrong in their own way. I think that's yep, hilarious. That's awesome. That's hilarious. awesome. And you know, and you know what? Good thing I, we don't I, have to worry about I, spelling. You know, a nature abhors a vacuum. So you know, what we need you know the song well, "Come on Eileen." Vacuum. Some "Come on Eileen." We need to have someone redo that as "Wake Up Marine." That's what I was saying on the last. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, you, we you weren't on that show. No, I wasn't on that. I show. I had the same thought. Get out of my head, dude! Oh, wow, well, we've been doing uh, this way too long scary. together. Yes, that's scary. we've been doing it together too long. Wait. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> um, uh, this has lasted more than four hours. We should probably see a doctor. <laughs> and in nine years. Wow. Wow. Oh, that's a lot of Viagra. That's a mega boner. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even All a right. redhead. All right, Larry. All right. Take us out so of that mega boner. Over and out. Mega boner. Redheads. <laughs> <laughs> Can I hang out with these guys? That is an inside joke. Uh, that's what she said. <laughs> Unless you were listening to the live stream. What are we Another listening to love. now? 
What was that? It was like a newscast from like Dave Portugal. Kennedy? Portugal. It was me doing my best radio announcer voice. And now. There we go. Delayed reaction. The conference call service that we use, yeah. <clears throat> instead of playing music now, is like a news broadcast. Oh, dear God. They like license content from yeah. somewhere. NPR FreeConferenceCall.com? It, well, it's not free conference oh. call. Some other conferencing system. Time to change <coughs> providers. That we use. Yeah. Are we still streaming? Yes. Okay. Just checking. So it was funny oh, you mentioned. Oh, you mean we have to behave? 